Hello, this is Anja Schäfer. I'm Omnek Onyx, friend and soul companion. In June 2023, we were in Mount Shasta, organized by Robert Potter at the conference and spent a week together in an Airbnb in the woods in Mount Shasta. And during this time, we also had one private group meeting, which I recorded. And the following excerpt of this recording is particularly interesting because Omnic is asked about her arrival on Earth, about her manifestation of her physical body and about her stay in Tibet in the beginning in the monastery of Agamdes. For those of you who have not heard Omnic recently, recently I mean in the last 14 years, um, you have to know that her speech is affected due to her stroke that she had in November 2009. So please ask, we ask you to be, to be patient and to enjoy her in her own words and with her own energy when she's talking about her unique story of how how she came to earth and about the first experiences that she had here. Does anyone have an idea of what I speak about? Talk about your, like, when you manifested the physical body, then yep. your trip here, like the on the ship with no shadows, the lights, and then coming to earth and talk about Agam Des. Yeah. Agam Des is a, a spiritual temple that resides on the physical and astral. And, and I stayed there when I came to Earth. It's like our ship was under the dome on the, on the physical. It come from the astral into the dome. And the dome is a protective city on the physical, which is all fire, and, but it's protection. And it resides in the physical and the astral for people who want to lower their vibrations and manifest their physical body. And you have to go to a certain temple where a lot of people assist in a mantra to manifest the physical body. And I told you already that I manifested a body that looked like Sheila because I had the genetics. But when we landed, I thought, I don't know where we're going. And my uncle said, we're going to Tibet first. I said, not to Tennessee where the little girl is? He said, no, he said, that comes later. I had to wait for the time when she was in. she was going from her mother to her grandmother, and grandmother hadn't seen her for several years, and she was under the care of the bus company and sat behind the bus driver. They were, it's called Traveler's Aid. They took care of her, and she had a note to for the cab driver to give to her grandmother because her grandmother didn't know she was coming. People didn't have telephones then, in 1955. They didn't have cell phones. Very few had a house phone because most of them were out of the times of the Depression. They were very poor. They struggled. And my grandma had 11 kids. Wow. <laughs> I said wow too. But <laughs> if I had 11 kids, I'd be hiding under the bed. <laughs> <laughs> Keep them from running over me and taking control. Yes. <laughs> That's not true, I wouldn't, but <laughs> it's how I felt. And when we came to Earth, uh, you can see um, through the magnifying glass and the, on the bottom of the ship, mm -hmm. it's a glass on the bottom that surrounds the landing gear so that you can mm -hmm. see the Earth and it you look wrong. like. You look like you're at rooftop level, but you're way up, but it has magnifying. And it's really weird to see people walk in cars. And I, wow, that's better than an airplane because it's really close. And 
I was fascinated. I was in the mothership for for two days, and the mothership came within a certain uh, far away from the earth, and the little ship goes down the ramp, slides down the ramp, and takes off. And of course, there's no movement. You feel like you're sitting in the chair still, and and the sound is like mantras and stuff surrounding you. And it also, when it, people hear it on Earth, it sounds like it's around. the whirring noise. And we landed at Tibet, and we went to up the mountain with um, guides, you know, what do they call them? Sherpas. Yeah. 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 They guided us up to the monastery, and it was quite a ways. But they found a plateau, a plateau that wasn't too high are too far away from the top. And we finally got there. And it, I was exhausted because I wasn't used to the gravity. And of the height, I mean, I was used to height in the ship, but not climbing. And my new, my body was new. So I got really tired suddenly and had difficulty breathing. And I, I, I reached the temple it's a big monastery built into the side of the mountain. And they created a paradise there. Because it's on the astral and the physical, they have, when you go there, all of a sudden you're in beautiful gardens and green, and it's warm, and there's butterflies, everything, because they're safe there. Because the environment is so much warmer than the area. And it was like a paradise. Except that they were really strict. When you went inside, they were so simple, very little furniture. And the monks uh, gathered in groups to do mantras and study. And each one had a different job to do. You know, there was a cook. And they changed places. <coughs> but they came from England, all over the, the world, to be a monk. It was their choice. And they could have left my family behind, children or wife, but that was their mission. And they were all wonderful, but they didn't know what to do with me because they never had a child in their monster, much less a girl. <laughs> and some of them didn't know what to do. How could they help me? But this man from England that was a monk, he had children and a wife, and he, he volunteered to help me because he knew how to take care of little girls and boys. And so <laughs> they, they tried to introduce me to food and, and water and how to nourish the body. And then they were trying um, to tell me I had to sleep. I said, mm -hmm. why? <laughs> we don't sleep on Venus. Right. Well, you're not on Venus. <laughs> and I said, I am not going to sleep. And I stayed awake for 30 hours. And I was sitting there falling asleep in my chair mm -hmm. because I was so tired of my body. And then I realized I can't stay focused if I don't rest. This is earth. And I really learned how to sleep because they took me to a nice bed instead of the cots like they have. They had a really soft place to lay on like a little mattress with feathers. I laid on and they brought me a pillow. But the rest of them, for reasons of discipline, only have cots and a simple table in their room. And I was fascinated. The whole place, your voice echoed in it, and there are monks scrubbing the floors, and monks making food, and some in the garden. They were all busy. And they assigned one to me to teach me to use my voice because I couldn't speak. And it sounded very guttural because I hadn't le learned to use my vocal cords. And they, they taught me mantras, all the mantras. And they set me up on the edge of a cliff so my voice could echo back and I could hear how my voice was developing. And of course, I sounded terrible at first. It sounded screeching, horrible sounds. And I kept practicing. And once I managed to do the mantras, I learned more and more how to sing, how to talk, and they taught me English. And 
But I know why they put me way away from the monastery, because it sounded terrible. <laughs> that was really the reason. They just told me it was for the echo. <laughs> but it was because my voice, I couldn't control it. And they were just trying to be kind. But it was wonderful there. And they introduced me to food and stuff, and mm -hmm. I get to taste everything and get used to it. And they tell me what this is and what that is. So I had to learn a lot about being on Earth. And at first, I forgot that I can't walk through walls. <laughs> and I must have bruised myself a lot. I trip over the chairs and the tables because I was thinking on Zenith, everything, you know, you can walk through this pure energy. On Earth, the energy is so low, it's solid. And I had to learn that. Wow. And the monks are always laughing at me, and especially they told me, "I'm Nick. You have to go to the toilet to eliminate everything from your body when your stomach gets full." Mm -hmm. They told me, and I said, "I won't. I'm not going to do that." Why? I said, "It's disgusting, <laughs> <laughs> and I don't want to." He says, "Well, you have to," and I said. I don't want to have to do anything. Mm. I have my free will. <laughs> and, and we had, they had such a hard time with me. They didn't know, they were frustrated, but they, they were laughing and saying <laughs> And they loved me eventually. And then I stayed there for um, a two years or three years. And Wasn't that long? Not that long. Yeah, before, before Sheila had her uh, bus accident. Yeah. And when she had the accident, we knew about it ahead of time. And we went to the crash site where the bus was burning and all the passengers standing wow. around. The bus driver was killed and so was Sheila wow. because they're at the front of the bus. And all the people are standing on the side and my uncle took me and put me in the crowd and left me. That was it. I had the mm -hmm. same clothes as Sheila, mm -hmm. little patent leather sandals, and I was a seven-year-old child. But actually, I was 130, and I knew so much, but I couldn't tell nobody. Yeah. Couldn't share what I knew. So I had to just learn to not speak because I'm a child. In their society, you don't speak unless you're spoken to. And that, that's the way Earth was. And I said, oh my God, it's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Poor children. <laughs> but, I was a child too, but I was more like an old lady. Yeah, I was telling you, this one little girl wanted a doll for Christmas. She's crying because she wanted a really expensive doll. And they bought her another, like a rag doll. And she said, no, I don't want this. I said, don't cry. It's a pretty doll, isn't it nice? I, I was like an old lady talking to her. And, and she quit crying. but. I wasn't like other children. I was trying to coax her very gently and, and and make her believe. I said, anything is a gift and you should be happy. If they can't buy you what you want, then give you something that's more precious. That's, and I didn't know that I was acting more like an old lady than a child. <laughs> and my grandmother told me, yeah, and my time with my grandmother is precious. It's all in a book, Angels Don't Cry. It's a picture of my grandmother, who, who the cab driver brought me to. When yeah. They drove me there and the bus crashed and they picked us up on a different bus and transported us to Chattanooga, Tennessee. And the cab driver drove me to her home. He had the address. And she opened the door at nighttime. And she said, my goodness, what are you doing here? I said, my mother sent me. And he said, yes, I've got a note for you. And it's my grandma's youngest daughter was my mother. And that was her baby girl. And she was the only one in the family with blonde hair and blue eyes. The whole family was Irish. They had red hair and English. So they weren't fair haired. And I don't know how or who her father was, but he wasn't the same as the others. My grandma must have had some boyfriends. <laughs> <laughs> Eleven kids, I guess. But they, I think grandma told me that 
Uh, her husband was dying from black lung. He was a coal miner. And she told me that when he was on his deathbed, that his best friend and her, you know, had a child together. He asked his best friend to take care of her because he was dying from black lung. You know, that was common then. The work in the coal mine was terrible. And many of them died from from the coal in their lungs. Mm -hmm. And they were underground all day at their work. And coal miners? Yes, it must be horrible. Like, um, what is that country music? Loretta Lynn? Yes. Her father was a coal miner. Coal miner's daughter. <laughs> yeah, I know. I love that song. Right. Anyway, um, I love being in the Tibetan temple with mm -hmm. the people and learning all the stuff. They taught me Sanskrit. Oh, all the mantras are in Sanskrit, yeah. and part of the word of the universal love and blessings be is Sanskrit. Baraka Bashan means may the blessings be, and it's very common in Tibet to say that. <laughs> They're not saying anything you have to do, they're saying may, right. may the blessings be. So that is a choice for you. So everybody should be having their free will and choices and not feeling like they have to. And many of the organizations ask you to do things at home that they force you or try to force you and maybe you don't like it or don't want to and you'd like to be free and do things but you don't want to sin, you don't want to go to hell. But th there is no hell. Mm, thank you. That's what I say, but the Christians say there is. Exactly. It's a controlling method to put you in fear. The fear of going to hell if you do something wrong, or being punished, and you can't cut your hair for a woman. You can't wear pants, and the men are in control, and the women are supposed to wear dresses below the knee, not cut their hair, don't wear makeup. Everything was. They had so many things. I said, "Well, what can you do?" <laughs> because I, there was so such a list, and I'm thinking, God don't want that. He, God wants you to be free and happy and partake of all the nature and the food and the drink that they have here. And drinking wine is not a sin either, because Christ drank wine, and it's from grapes. It's very healthy, but you don't overindulge. That's when you get drunk. That's the thing. It can be dangerous for you because your health, and because when you're drunk, you can get injured without knowing it. And so drinking is okay, but in small quantities. Keep your balance. Maybe at New Year's have champagne, or if you're celebrating. But some people don't like the taste. That's okay. I didn't like the taste either. I had my first alcoholic beverage when I was 35. I would raised all my children, and now they were more toward adulthood, and I wasn't influencing them. I experimented on my own with drinks of different kinds. But anyway, I enjoyed myself, and I, I went to the discos, and I danced, and I did all the things that, that you do when you're young because I didn't do that until I was 35, and my children were not present. It was because I missed those years. I overindulged when I did have freedom because I wanted to try everything. <laughs> now that I could, I wanted to try everything, at, at least in small quantities, to see if it tastes good or feels good, and what I like and what I don't. But it was really a trip for me that I had my first cigarette at age 52. Because I used to love to have brandy, but I can't drink when I'm doing lectures and appearances. I, I wouldn't be in the right consciousness. But, but I can go out and have a cigarette and relax. And I love the taste of the menthol because it soothes my throat. I don't. It's not going to hurt me. And so I love smoking with others because I want you to know, around me you can do anything that you love. I won't criticize. I'll join you. 
<laughs> that's the whole thing. Yeah. That's primarily why I smoke. But the other one is I like it. Like Rob said. <laughs> I like it. The way he says it. I know, it's funny. No, he's, he's trying to mimic me. Mimic. <laughs> he sounds so funny. 